welcome everybody to the spring 2014 Walk Plan Lecture. Um, it's great to have such a great crowd and obviously very appropriate for our speaker tonight because she's had such a fabulous history, which Dave Blog will talk about. Um, but my name is Claire Hassler Lewis. I'm the executive director of the Robert Mondavi Institute. For those of you who haven't been to the Walt Plans Lectureship, this is an endowed lecture series. Uh, was endowed by Berger Glass, now Treasury Wine Estates. And I know there's somebody from Treasury Captain here. I think she's not here yet. Um, in honor of Walt Plans, who was their CEO and on the honor of his retirement. He's normally here, but I think he's at a San Francisco Game, baseball game. So, uh, <laughs> um, so it's geared towards wine business, and we like to make sure there's a lot of students here. So I'm pleased to see some students, and it's been a fascinating uh, opportunity to showcase some of the top folks in the wine business over the last. I think we started this in 2006, and tonight will be no exception with Mary Edwards. And uh, with no further ado, I will turn it over to our department chair, David Block. Thanks, Claire. <coughs> it's, my, it's my pleasure and honor to actually introduce uh, Mary Edwards for uh, this year's Cleanse Lecture. Uh, we actually had a nice visit before this. It's great to be able to meet her and her husband, Ken, um, and talk about what they're doing and show them what we're doing here. Um, Mary's uh, career in wine really started back when she was getting her undergraduate degree at UC Berkeley. It wasn't in wine, obviously, it was in physiology, but that's where she really took to uh, growing things, I guess, right? Fermenting things. Um, and in 1971, um, while she was attending uh, graduate school at Berkeley, she met another one of her graduates, Andrew Quaddy, who uh, actually let her know that there was a program here at Davis where you could learn how to make wine professionally. She transferred over, got her master's degree in, in uh, analogy here, food science, I guess, from food science at that point, uh, to learn how to be a winemaker. Uh, she was one of the first women uh, students coming through here, female winemakers coming through here, uh, which in itself was a challenge for her. Uh, after leaving here, she, she worked for a number of wineries, including Mount Eden Vineyards, uh, right after she left here, and until 1997 when she opened up her own label, uh, Mary Edwards Winery, uh, along with her husband and some friends. In 2006, they were actually able to build uh, their current winery out in uh, Sonoma. actually had the pleasure of visiting there last summer. Uh, I encourage all of you to go and visit. Uh, it's a great place to, to uh, see in Sonoma and a really nice tasting room uh, to visit and taste their, their wonderful wines. So Mary has been making wine for 40 years, as her, as her title says, um, and during that time she's had her share of accolades and awards. I'd like to just point out two that are recent. Uh, she was recently, last year I believe, inducted into the CIA's uh, Winemakers Hall of Fame, Vintners Hall of Fame. Uh, we were actually there for that event. It was a very nice event. Um, and she also won the coveted James Beard Award for Best Wine, Beer, and Spirit Professional in the United States. So without further ado, uh, we're very lucky to now have Mary Edwards as uh, this this year's Walt Plains Lecture. Again, I started thinking back about everything that's gone on and what's happened in my my career, and uh, let's see, make sure I'm going the right way. Uh, and uh, I think I never really understood what I was getting into when I decided to uh, transfer from Berkeley to Davis, and 
what a kind of a, well, I never was really a rebellious kind of political person. Even at Berkeley, I tried to avoid all that stuff. But I really didn't, couldn't avoid it here. So I started here, as I said, in, in, in 1971. And one of the first things I faced was um, unfair recruitment practices going on in our department. And I feel very proud of the fact that I was able to um, make changes in those policies so that everyone, not just women, but all students in the department had an equal shot at uh, job solicitations coming into the department. Uh, the way it used to work was that people in history would write their favorite professor, and that professor would give those letters just to the pocket students that were their favorite students, and nobody else ever saw them. And I thought that had nothing to do with women or men. It had to do with fairness. So again, I became a not rebellious. I don't think of myself as being, but I thought this was unfair. And so I uh, got that change. So I'm very, I'm very proud of that. That's something that I contributed here at the university. Um, the other thing that, that I realized that I did that didn't seem like that much at the time because it was just my, my thesis. Um, I worked with, I was the last graduate student with Dr. Maynard Amory. It was wonderful to meet his last, last student. And we were friends and met pretty good for lunch until he passed away. Um, but he, he laughed because when I finished my master's, he said, I fooled you. I said, what do you mean you fooled me? He said, I, I got you to do two, the equivalent of two master's theses, which were to, number one, create a way to analyze lead and wine, and then to do this huge survey. He said, you could have gotten your master's degree in one. I said, thanks for telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this research was funded uh, by the Wine Institute, and when I finished my research, obviously I had very prestigious backing, um, they refused to allow me to publish my work. Because, of course, this is going to make a major change in the closures that were available to the industry. So again, it wasn't really my intention to be a, uh, a game changer, but, but I was. So I feel proud of that because now we have all these different closures and I kind of started that, that ball rolling. So, you know, who knew? Little girl from Clifford. Um, so then I finally uh, did complete my master's and, uh, you know, back then, of course, there was no master's in theology. There was, I had to go, you went through whatever department was the most similar to yours. So I went through food science because I was in nutrition at Berkeley and I transferred, I actually did my research in that department, but I got my, you know, theology degree through, um, through the main department. So it's very certain, you know, circuitous route to get your degree. But um, I, I say that really my problem was, of course, being a woman back then because I guess my dad never really explained to me that I couldn't do whatever I wanted to do. You know, they never did tell me you have to do this career because only girls can do this and boys can do that. So people asked me kind of coming forward, I mean, didn't you notice that what was going on? I said, yeah, but it's just like I just kept doing what I wanted to do. I mean, it has nothing to do with, with uh, your gender. Uh, but of course, it was very difficult for me to get a job. And uh, I say that the way I got my first job at Miami was because of my gay support team. And all those men um, were my friends, and they all supported me. I guess they thought that you know, they were different, but I was different too, and they supported me because they just looked at my mind, my ability, what I could do. Um, back then, of course, we did a lot by hand. I was very active and outdoorsy, and then I did very well in school, so they supported me. Two were professors here. Um, my first boss was gay, and also my first consultant, so I had very, very strong support. To tell you the truth, I don't know I would have made it uh, without them. So I'm here today because of them. That's, I give them credit. So there I am, you know, Berkeley glasses and my tie-dye shirt at my first job uh, at Nandi, 2,000 feet above the uh, Santa Clara Valley. And uh, I was thinking of all the things that have changed because I'm going to go to later by thinking, wow, we didn't even have great bins, you know, the plastic bins that are over in the facility. We had wooden 
blood boxes, which themselves weighed, I don't know, 20 pounds, and they put the grapes in that. We hand-loaded those into the crusher, which was a tiny little thing with a little tiny motor that used to set on top of the tank. And you had to take all those grapes in those blood boxes. Times have changed, you know? Um, going the wrong way here. So uh, the next thing I got involved in uh, was when I went to Matanzas Creek, which was my second job in Snow County. And uh, I was asked by the owners to plant a Chardonnay vineyard. They had a Cabernet vineyard and a Merlot vineyard. And they said, we want you to select you know, Chardonnay to plant. I go, hmm, what does that mean? Is all Chardonnay the same? Or is there other differences? So I went and visited Dr. Olmo, and I still have the tape, because I taped our conversation. And he was very thrilled to have me come and talk to him, because uh, he wanted to look into clones, which were actually, a lot of work was going on at that time in France. This is back in the, you know, the late 70s, and nothing was happening here. No one would support his research in that area. They wanted him to just make new grape varieties by seed genetics, like Symphony. There's a successful one. You know, or what is it? Some of the ones that we use for coloring matter, all these different weird, weird, weird ones, which never really went anywhere. So he was very supportive and set me up with all these visits um, in France. And when I went over there, it was like I had no idea of what I was getting into because again, here I am, just this normal person. I'm not really political, I'm not really an activist. And I go over there and see all this research that the French are doing. And I'm thinking, why don't we know anything about this? We know nothing. They have these vineyards with, you know, 50, 100 different clones of Pinot Noir. And no one's heard about this in our country. And I think it's because you know, the French are so good. You know, they're telling everybody, it's all about the terroir, you know? It's about, you have to be at the right longitude and latitude, and you have to have the right soil, otherwise just forget making wine. So that was their diversionary tactic. So when I went over there, and they were very welcoming, um, and I look, looked into what they were doing, I came back so incredibly excited about what I'd seen. You know, the people thought I was nuts. <laughs> They're like, it's all about the terroir, it's about the dirt. It's not nothing to do with it. Yeah, I said, guys, I have no idea, you ever seen you know, Pinot Noir goes like this, and it goes like this, and I mean, you know, clusters are huge, or they're little, or very different sizes. They're, they were making, in France, they were making, they had, like, you guys think you have small tanks over there in the new building? They had little tiny five-gallon mini fermenters, mini presses, all this tiny stuff. It's like a dollhouse. Anyway, um, so I went ahead and planted for the owners of Tanzas Creek a little clone, d diverse clone vineyard for them. And then um, I went back and, you know, I'm still working with Dr. Olmo, and the result of those first wines that we actually were able to bottle then, uh, we used those at kind of the pivot point for a weekend class. It was all on about clones. This was the first class at the university in 1985. It was an extension class. And then it just kind of exploded from there uh, because people couldn't deny the truth, you know? <laughs> it was, this stuff is important. And so um, from there I went on to work with Kernos Creek on their huge trials of 20 different clones. And uh, Simi uh, started doing his Cabernet in your trials and Chardonnay. And I, I used to give what I call clone tours where I would take people and say, okay, this is this clone growing in Alexander Valley, and I heard it's going to the Russian River. Do you taste it's the same? I mean, it's a little different from the place, but it still has a, common, a commonality you can't deny. So I laugh today when I look at young winemakers who just say, well, I'm going to plant, you know, 777 from Dijon or whatever, and they have no idea where that came from. That's just part of what they have to use, and it's incredible. So. Anyway, more, more rabble browsing on my, my part. So there I am. And Ken says this is my great face here. Um, when, I, when I was first a uh, Tansas Creek winemaker, I went there in 77. And this is it's more about the glasses. You know, the glasses change in the hair. 
Um, and this is, I'm actually pregnant inside this tank. You can't see my big, my big belly, but I am pregnant. And there's my first son, who was born, uh, he was three months old at harvest. And back then, we didn't have maternity. I never even thought of the concept. Ben was six weeks old when I just took him back to the winery and we just strapped him on it. We got to work. Because you can't do that now, I don't know. Another, another cute glasses picture of me. Old things there. So, you know, um, I went into consulting after working for Matanzas Creek and uh, Mount Eden because it really gave me the opportunity, uh, this is other women have done this, uh, Heidi Barrett did this, Julia Anatos, <coughs> you know, you get to that point where you have all these, when you have kids, you need to be able to have a little more flexibility in your time. So um, I did this to support my family and, uh, and it ended up then moving into my own winery at some point. point. But it also gave me the chance to do the next most important thing I think I've done, which is mentoring young people, and not only young people, but young women. So uh, we always have, I'd say, about 50% of our interns every year. We have, we have 10 now. I like lots of help with harvest. And uh, we work an 18-hour day, so I need two shifts. And uh, we always have a lot of young women. They come from all over the world. They're not selected because they're women. They're selected actually by my sister winemaker, who's a guy, and her solo master, who's a guy. So I don't say you have to hire 50%. They hire the best people. And it just turns out it usually is about 50%. Um, so I think that's good. I think that, that I always say, you know, living by example is the way to go. And, and being a mentor for young people and for young women, I think, is good. I think 10 years after I graduated from here, I was asked to come back and teach a class, a week, other weekend class. This weekend class was supposed to be for young women so that they could, I could kind of mentor them in how they could even get a job in the wine business. So that's kind of interesting. Back then, I think about 6% of the wine makers in California were women. It hasn't really changed a lot today. It's about 10%. So another statistic to keep in there. So when I started consulting, I didn't have fax. I had no computer. And I had no cell phone. How could we exist without these things? Pretty soon I had a, a Canon laptop with a printer built in. So I could go around my different clients. I could actually print out work orders as I was in. That was cool. They didn't recreate that one though. So. Anyway, I, I, I had a hard time giving up consulting because I call it the wheel of learning. You know, because you go out there and see what people are doing, and then you, you need to teach them what to do. But in teaching them, you're reviewing everything and looking at what's new. And they're asking you questions about, will this work, will that work? And so it constantly causes you to rethink what you're doing and what you're teaching them. So that's, that's hard to give up. I finally had to give it up when we started our own line though, which is too much. So there I am with my good friend, uh, Julia Iantos, who I consulted for for many years. Uh, she's a mom, and then she had uh, two kids one while they were working together, and I was her complete backup. Um, when she went to labor, we had this whole thing planned. If she did labor, I would be there for her. And uh, so I went more frequently than I would to my normal clients. But she managed to get through to the last tank being pressed before she went to the hospital. <laughs> so it's like, oh, crazy days. So anyway, we used to like do sessions after that with you know one daughter with a playmate in the winery and the other one on, in a rocky thing on the on the, the lab bench while we tried to do our blending or whatever we were trying to do. But, my husband calls that multitasking. He thinks it doesn't, isn't possible, but for women, it's kind of something you have to do. I'm not even watching my time. Where are those? What time am I going to? 6.30. Oh, including okay. some Q&A. I have an ocean of time. OK. So uh, moving forward, um, I purchased a piece of property as a single mom when I was in 1996 that was potential vineyard property, but of course I had to figure out how I was going to make that happen. I was taking care of two little kids. 
And um, in 1997, I met my husband, Ken, handsome guy over here in the blue shirt. And you know the good thing about this partnership? I mean, we're still married after 17 years of working together every day. Wow. You know? That's a lesson in life. Oh, he has to say something. Else. I do need to say something. Okay. Uh, when you were describing earlier your your um, research work here at the university on on closures, yeah. uh, what she was actually doing was she's the one who had them outlaw lead capsules. I think you you call them closures, but the actual lead capsule uh, business went. That's why there was so much resistance to it. Right. to her work was because they outlawed lead capsules. Now we have tin capsules, but the lead caps, she proved that the lead was getting into the wines uh, with her research work, and that was part of the reason. I just wanted to make sure we got Thank that clear. You You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the reason we make a good partners is because um, he was a state farm insurance agent. <laughs> and so you always need a good salesperson, right, on the team. And when we met, he said, honey, I can sell insurance. I can share in hell, sell your wine. <laughs> That's kind of how it's been. So um, in 98, we planted our first vineyard. And then I planted the second one in 2001. And I, you know, I never dreamed when we started this business out of our house in Forestville that we would wind up being able to build a winery building. I mean, it was just like totally how would we ever get to that point? How would we ever have enough money, enough financing? How would we ever make that much wine that we could justify that? Um, well, in 2006, we actually broke ground and we actually financed ourselves. I mean, whew, it's amazing to me. And then in 2007, we had our first harvest in the, in the new winery. And in 2008, we opened our tasting room. In 2010, Kind of still in the downturn, we actually expanded our wine building. That was amazing. Um, and now we farm about six different estate properties. Another is under expansion. Uh, two are being prepared for planting. I'm doing a lot of planting in Sauvignon Blanc. We started off primarily with Pianor, for those of you who know us. And um, my target is by 2018 for us to be 100% estate bottled with all of our own vineyards. So, it's a long way to come from 1996 with a piece of land, an idea to have a business, to in 18, so that's only 20 years to go from no facility, no vineyards, to everything, 25,000, 26,000 cases, or a little bit more sometimes, uh, 20 years later. I mean, it's just gone by a flash, just like that. You know, uh, when I was getting ready for to put together the blend, so it might, I had my 30th um, anniversary. I bottled what I call 30, you know, my 19th anniversary. And now that it's 40, I'm doing the 40th. So I approached the same artist because we have to do a special, you know, painted bottle and all that stuff. And he goes, Oh my God, it's already time for the 40th? And I go, Yeah. He goes, That's depressing. I'm like, What's depressing about it? We're both still here, you know? Anyway, he's a funny guy. So, Anyway, like I said, it's hard to believe all that's been accomplished in 40 years. So it doesn't really seem that, like that long to me. Um, oh yeah, this is me on my, my French of one of those barrels, $1,000 a pop. Um, so here's our winery. Have, how many of you been there? So yeah, you have. Isn't that pretty? So we have a lot of things in common with some of the stuff you're doing here, which I'll get into. And there I my, my new cellar. So I thought maybe I'd move to now talking about the changes. But of course, the tour made me think about even more changes. It's hard to think about everything that's happened because there's so much that's gone on. And because of the new facility here, it's like, whew, there's a lot that's happened. I think that one of the most important things that's happened is a change in our attitude about making wine and that the focus and the foundation has to be wine growing. That maybe that seems obvious to students who are here today, but remember that when I came to school here, I had to choose enology or viticulture. There was no idea that you would do a degree that had both. You know? And so that's what I did. I thought, well, I'm a chemist, I love gardening and everything, but I guess I'll choose enology, which is what I did. And then I had to spend many years 
learning and earning my own degree in viticulture, studying on my own, making my own mistakes. And um, now it's a combined degree here, right? Isn't that right? It's a combined degree. Just like it is at um, Cal Poly. And is it that way at Fresno too? No. Really the thing is I think Cal Poly and Fresno, you can't graduate without doing an internship. Is it that way here? Um, no? For the professional science master's program. Otherwise, most of the students do them, but it's not required. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a really good thing, too. Um, I think it was, I don't know what you're doing about business, but I just put that in there because we had nothing about business. When we were talking, I was telling him that we didn't have any tasting except for, you know, Dr. Amory's sensory class. And so we hired uh, Daryl Cordy to come in and introduce us to wines of the world. Back then, 40 years ago, he's still doing that now. He's still doing tasting. Isn't that amazing? I saw him at the James Beard Awards wearing this huge cape. <laughs> he's such a great guy. And um, so he kind of adopted our class. He'd come and do these tastings every week. Of course, everyone was into Bordeaux events. That's all we tasted. It was just Bordeaux or But anyway, it was good. But then he adopted us, and he would take us to his house. And he and his boyfriend would make us, oh, there's another Anyway, uh, they would make us these beautiful dinners, multiple course dinners, and then you pull out all these really old wines. So that enhanced our education. We also didn't have any equipment. So we, we created another class where we would bring in equipment people to actually show us what, the, what a pump looked like. You know, I mean, my first job, I didn't even have a pump when I went there. No pump. No pump. Everything grabbed it. Anyway, so we had to create these classes, which you have now. So that's a huge change. Um, most of the students that we see, and primarily now we try and hire people who have, are, have just graduated for our internships, or they've already graduated. I would say most young people go through at least four internships before they land any other job. Because it's not like, when I was went to school, there was actually a dart of winemakers. You know, now it takes a while to get into the, I believe, I went straight from school, I got a job as a winemaker. Thank God I had a consultant. It would have been, I didn't know how to filter, I didn't know how to do anything, really. He, he showed me how to do everything. So, um, I did a little bit about pops, though. <laughs> um, but I think people go from one continent to another, you know. They, they come to California, they go to New Zealand, they here, they go to South Africa. Last year we had two Argentinian women. We had uh, a couple from, they were both in the wine making. Uh, they were from Australia, had three South Africans. You know, there's a lot of exchange. I think the interesting thing that I don't see uh, is French interns. And I think that's a real problem for them because they're not really sharing in the ideas of the world. You think they already know it all, which is never good. You've got to always keep learning. So I think that this change in attitude then has led from when, when I graduated, the whole idea was, OK, if you're a winemaker, you've got to take the grapes and you've got to beat them into submission. You've got to make them your own. You've got to put your stamp on that wine. There was nothing about the character of the vineyard at all, which always kind of confused me because maybe I started off with a really big vineyard at Mount Eden where the grapes were, you know, the vineyard was older and it was just wonderful character. So I never really got that part. Uh, but I think the new focus now is really on, on true terroir. And this has really led people to be so much more proud of their region and to appreciate where they are uh, in their own appellation. And then to focus on that, rather than being so, you know, Euro-centric or Francophobic, I think that you have to make something. I use all the time, well, you know, you know, are you trying to make a Burgundian style you know, I go, well, I'm not a Burgundy. How could I make a Burgundian style you know? You know, how can I make a Sancerre so it don't walk? I'm very proud to be in California. And I'm making the wines that grow here. And I'm damn proud of that. So I, I never 
I never really got that part that we always have to be copying something else, especially when they're even moving. They're just kind of stalled there. So the tools we have today, like we just, I think, finally, two years ago, I got my own phenolic lab set up at the winery. We're very, I'm very, you know, sensory side and the techie side. You know, I'm just, you know, I tell my husband I was a really geeky girl in school. But, so I really like the technical side, but I really appreciate my sensory side too. But I like to have all the tools. So we have a very good um, laboratory. And we do our own knowledge chemistry now. Uh, work quite closely with uh, Doug Adams on this. So it's really been a nice um, partnership. And I appreciate all that he's doing in that realm because it's fairly important for our winemaking. I was thinking, I saw over there, you guys have a system like we have which is the, the tank net system. You know, the previous generation was hardwired. You know, the tanks were all wired through the building um, electrical system to your computer. Now we just do it on our iPhones, on our iPads. We can do it from home. We can do it from Europe. You know, you get that alarm and go at night. Actually, I don't make it anymore. My system, I make it the alarms. You know, but, um, you know, I mean, that's, like really new. When I built the winery, I didn't want to pay for the hard wiring, but I put the right controllers on the tanks, and boom, here you are. It's, that, that, that's how fast the technology is. And that is the best insurance policy I've ever paid for, is that tank, that system. It's phenomenal. Because if a, ten, if a tank goes, you know, you've got a five ton tank or a 10 ton tank, you know, you've got five tons that are, you know, $5,000, $6,000, $7,000 a ton. And that tank gets too hot or freezes out during the middle of the fermentation. And that was going to be a vineyard, doesn't it? Now it's going into a regional line. That's a lot of that's a lot of insurance. And it has not nothing as bad has happened since we had that system in place. Um, just thinking back to my picture, you know, my picture there at Mount Eden, we did everything by foot. We put I had I only had three tanks. That seemed like a lot, but we punched them down six times in 24 hours by foot. We didn't have any kind of pump over system, nothing. So now we have, at our winery, we have the, um, I would call it probably the newest generation, not a submerged cap as you can have or automated pump over, but um, a punch down system that is operated versus by a radio. Okay, so you stand on the deck. So the deck in our winery, the, the catwalk deck, there are no guardrails. It's all designed with a full deck that the tanks are the guardrail. And you just walk down that floor and you just can move that punch down device anywhere in that bank of tanks and you just move it into place, move anywhere in the tank and it operates with basically a little thing that looks like a joystick, but it's, it's actually radio. That is awesome, because it means that every tank gets the same quality of a punch down. Somebody's not tired, you know. Even those, the old fashioned ones that you could move around, still take a lot of muscle to get them, even though they're counterweighted to get them in position. Have you guys seen those systems? Yeah. Um, all of our tanks are piped with hot and cold glycol. Yours are going to be piped with hot and cold water. But you know, not that many wineries have that. That's, that's a pretty newer technology. Um, I say that our winery is simple, but I have all the toys. You know, I, It's a simple building. It's insulated to the, not to the amount this one is, but insulated to the hill, I thought. And, uh, but I spent the money on the equipment. Um, so each one of our punch down systems that are radio operated have two of them to feed two big banks of tanks. Uh, each one of those at $2,007 to $60,000. That's a lot for somebody without a grant from Jess Jackson or, you know, or Treasury of United States or whoever. Um, the other thing is, back then, there were no metal racking systems for barrels. Everything was natural stacked. You know, I lifted barrels up three high by myself on my stack, no forklift, 
Now we have all these beautiful stings. I have all stings still back, so I'm not doing that. Everything's for the um, I think the other thing is we, you know, we, bar we barcode all of our barrels, you know, and we barcode our cases. That didn't exist. Of course, inventory is so a problem, isn't it? I mean, you can never get it right, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't so I think the other thing that is very um, uh, poignant here is that, you know, you have this beautiful winery here, and I hadn't been on this tour before, so I just came today for my first time. I didn't need to get over here, but I haven't done it. But this is what I'm saying. This, this, I wrote this before I've been here, but it's really an emphasis on sustainability now. And I think that the thing about sustainability that is really important and the reason it's working is because it's actually a good business decision. You know, people do things when it makes sense. It makes economic sense and it makes quality better, right? And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about getting off the grid, all these things, you know. Um, so that is a good business decision. I think one thing we use chlorine for some, we don't use any chlorine here anymore, you know, never. But we've, we've replaced that. That was, that was the industry chemical, was, was chlorine. Um, solar power is a big thing. Our winery is 100% solar powered, as is our home. Our, the entire south facing roof, 50% of our roof is covered with panels. People come into the winery, they don't even notice it's got solar because it's, the roof looks like it's one single surface. And um, the other thing we were talking about today is the solar installation itself gives you another layer of insula insulation on your building. That you don't even think about when you're installing it. So that's a, that's a wonderful thing. We're talking about water recycling. Um, I was disappointed that I couldn't find an electric hot water here. I couldn't really afford to do uh, solar hot water at the time we built our winery. I was forced to go to propane, which was just like, oh. But at least I did the on-demand. There's big industrial on-demand machines, which have a brain. They turn on in series, so that made me feel a little bit better. And we replaced all the lighting, you know, that we're using. Uh, the high bays are very uh, recent technology. And also, we don't have to always use concrete anymore. You know, we can use permeable concrete that allows the water to run through. Uh, and we, like in our, our parking lot, a lot of it is uh, permeable concrete. So I think that that's kind of the winery side, not that that's everything. These are just some of the things I thought about yesterday. Um, in the vineyard, we've, we've changed so much, it's just almost unrecognizable uh, the way we farm now compared to the way we used to farm. You know, the, the modern trellis system we do allow for very targeted application of chemicals. So that means we can use drastically less than we had to in the old days. Um, it's funny because in our area, people are, are, some people say, well, you know, there's all these vineyards and they're replacing apple orchards, but apple orchards are, the trees are 30 feet high and they still spray with those rigs up that high where grapes, you've got the targeted application, you've got high respect sprayers now that even reduce more what you, what you need to use. So I think those, the, the decrease in use of chemicals, I think is a really important uh, thing for us. And then, you know, we've greatly reduced our water consumption. You know, back in the day, we either didn't have irrigation or they used, in Central Valley, they still used what you call trenches, row irrigation. We have drip now. This just seems normal to us to have drip. Uh, we use the water deficit theory irrigation, which actually increases red grape, grape quality while uh, saving water. And then we have the tools to monitor that. Uh, the, you know, the new trap probes are really old. I don't really like those so much, but the pressure bottle is my favorite. I can't really get into the leak barometer, but these are tools that you can, you can use. We've gone to um, micro sprinklers for um, frost protection, and uh, it's part of the same irrigation system and versus the old overhead sprinklers, which used over three times the amount of water. And uh, that's a big thing. Then the other thing that's so, so funny to me in our area, 
people are always saying that they call the vineyards industrial because they have metal in them. So I say, really? Okay. These in posts that are metal are made from recycled um, uh, upset tubing from drill rigs, okay? Recycled. The, the highway posts we use now are made from recycled carbides. You know, in the old days, they used pressure, they used this pressure treated uh, redwood stakes and posts that you had to treat with these noxious chemicals. You can't even take those posts to the dump. There's no place to take them. You have to take them to a, you know, a contamination site. So I say, how is, you know, metal rusts goes back to the earth. These chemicals, where do they go? So people, the problem with people today, they really don't think through everything. They make these snap judgments about, about how farming looks to them from the outside without really considering, you know, all the important um, uh, factors. So there, is Ken and I at our solar powered wind up on the roof. What a rush that was. So you get up there on that roof and just look at all that solar. So, so the, I think the most exciting thing for us was we invested this huge solar system and uh, PGE has to come out and turn it off for you. You know, they're not off the grid. And so the day they came out to turn it on, they didn't have enough back protection in the line. And our, what, we have 150 kilowatts. This actually went through the grid and did the power brown up in the next town. <laughs> <laughs> up the road, I was very proud of that. That was just awesome. So, um, you know, we do a lot of, if, if you go to our website, you see we have a whole sustainability page. Um, we have you know, all boxes of all the vineyards. And I probably should put a picture of one of our cats in here because it was saying that. Cooper Smith, which is six and a half acres, now with three feral cats and one adopted cat who was let off by the side of the road, we now don't have to track any gophers. And in Sebastopol, we have a lot of gophers. So it's, you know, between the owls catching the gophers and the cats, it's amazing what they do. Uh, we use a lot of uh, natural cover crop. We can't use cover crop overall in our area because there's so many gophers, we have to alternate rows because if we don't disc the row every other year, the gophers make such huge uh, highways, but especially on our hillside vineyards, the water just runs through those those underground tunnels and erodes the soil terribly. So we kind of come to this alternate uh, row disking, but this is the way you can see there's the alternate row there. It's being dissed. Well, it's just something we found in our one more day. I think that, you know, one of the important lessons that I have learned through my, throughout my career, uh, I feel like I've always told myself I've got to learn at least one new thing about wine making every year. I have to continue to expand my knowledge and pursue that. Um, and maybe that's what's kept me interested all these years, because you never should give up learning, and you should always emphasize that. Um, I think that the reason we've been successful in our business, even through the downturn, we've been profitable since our first sales year, but that's because we have been disciplined, we've been dedicated, uh, we don't ever want to disappoint our customers, so our, our whole mantra is that every year the wine is better, we sell direct to 500 restaurant accounts in California ourselves. No, not brokers, not any of that stuff. And um, my sister does all the billing. <laughs> and the, the, the telling point to me is that it's very rare when we change vintages that anyone ever asks for a sample bottle. Because that means we've built trust in, in our customers and uh, they know that we're going to deliver what we've told them. And you know, it's not that easy to do. You know, you think you can make one good vintage, you can make a second good vintage, but you know, you got to keep it up. You got to keep the same standards up. People walk into our winery after, let's see, 2006 we started building it. Um, we just been redoing all the floors. Because you have concrete, if you're a neat nick like we are, um, 
you erode, the more you wash, the more you erode the concrete, right? It's like a downward spiral. So we just installed all new uh, durable surfaces on top of the concrete. Um, because we're just, people walk into the library and say, it's so clean in here. It looks like your research facility. I say, well, we're making food here. Of course it's clean. Why is food? They don't really, it's hard for them to kind of get that. Um, the other thing is I think that we all have to be true to our own goals and not let other people tell us what to do, what kind of style of wine to make, what kind of style of business to run. Um, I learned the lesson about style of wine from some friends of mine in Glen Ellen who had a small winery and they became, I see this a couple times where people are working with a distributor and they tell them you need to make this or that or more of this or you know whatever without a consideration of what the wine can actually do or what they want to do. And that generally leads to failure. If you believe in what you produce, you're going to do much better. Um, I think you have to listen to your own voice and, and follow, follow not only your heart, but your sensibility. Um, having been in the wine business for 25 years before we started our project, I said, I'm not, I'm not doing the three-tier thing or going outside that model, you know? And I had friends that just said, you're never going to make it. You know, how do you do this, you know? And I said, we're going to do it. And that's one of the reasons that we've been profitable because I learned all those lessons in 25 years and uh, didn't want to go down that path. So I think, I didn't put it here, but something I think we all need to do too, uh, especially when you start a business and you have people working for you, you have got to take care of yourself. You've got to take care of yourself or you're not going to be able to lead those people because in the wine business, you're like a cheerleader, you're like a quarterback, you know, you've got to keep all those people fed and growing during harvest, you know, besides everything else you're doing, right? Like in my company, I'm the winemaker, the CEO, the CFO, my husband does all the sales. But, you know, if you don't take care of yourself, you don't need to take care of the people who work for you, and they are the heart of your, you can't get by without them. You can only go so far on your own. Um, but I think the main and most important thing is to follow your passion. You know, find a passion and follow it. So with that, I guess I can open for questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to aspiring educated winemakers um, looking to start their own label in California and making more obscure grape varieties and hybrids and the whole six to ten grapes that are sold? That's a hard road. Um, there were a lot of people starting on that road before the downturn. And uh, what those people found was that when times get tough, people go to the dependable varieties. And so, um, you know, when you think about it, some things even like Syrah, which everybody thought would take off like a rocket, had really not gone anywhere. Because varieties need a leader. So the reason things like Chardonnay and Cabernet and Pinot Noir have done so well is because there's so many leaders around the world to pull up everybody who's making those wines. Uh, the problem with these obscure varieties is there's there's not enough pull. You know, I was kind of outside the box, maybe starting to make some young long from Russia over in 2001, which doesn't sound right, but back then, there was not a category on the wine list in most restaurants for Sauvignon Blanc. I should have done on my list because it's like one of the things that I've actually promoted and the sommeliers have got behind because they realized the versatility of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so I just say, you know, you really have to think through that and know if you have enough financial wherewithal to, because it's really about constant education. I would talk to people who have, who you've seen, who have tried to do that and ask them how it's going. Because I would be very hesitant to get it, 
maybe you want to have something as a core that you know is going to be more mainstream and then have some of your side projects which you can sell through your tasting room, through your wine list, where you can do a lot of education on the spot rather than trying to get that during the wine list, which is really tough. Oh, there you go. All right. Um, you mentioned this issue of terroir versus winemaking. And today, when you see marketing from many companies, but they have a winemaker quoted as saying, I just let the vineyard speak for itself for some other belonging like that. <laughs> so, but you can see where I'm coming from. So, sure. I'm just wondering how, you know, how do you that to your customers? How do you portray the difference between or the importance of vineyard and site versus winemaker who obviously has to make many decisions regardless of what grapes are there? Right. Well, so that's a good question with many parts. Uh, one of the parts is that terroir, terroir is has many encompassing factors. Terroir is not just the longitude, latitude, or the dirt, or the elevation of the vineyard to the sun. It's the trellising. It's the watering. It's the input of the grower, or the vineyardist, or the winemaker. So it's a very, to me, it's a broad category. So not every winemaker has input on the growing process which is the problem number one, which is why I've gone to growing everything, because I just can't deal with all the intermediaries and them not doing what I feel they should be doing in order to make the best wine in that site. So to me, if you're looking for a site or a piece of ground that you think has good potential, good terroir, if you will, starting from the ground up. And then you have to come up with a selection of rootstock that you think is going to do well there. And then a clone selection you think will thrive there. You know, and I say that, you know, I would never say I'm hands off. I would say that what I do is I'm promoting the important attributes to me. Because everybody has a style. My style happens to be that I like a lot of fruit meaning the fruit of the vineyard, the flavor of the place. And so I'm trying to make sure I create that by optimizing whatever will do best there. And then to have a fixation on, on the palate and on, I have a very low threshold for bitterness, so I, my wines tend to be really supple and sweet, not sugar, but, but sweet, because I can't stand any bitterness. So that's, so my style overrides those things. But I'm, in the best years, if I'm farming well, my work is done, pretty much. I just have to try not to screw it up once I get the grapes in the winery, right? It's like, I used to say 75% is all done in the year. I think more like 85% now. Mm. So we spend a lot of money on our vineyards, uh, probably too much for common sense. But because we're, vertically integrated, that goes into the wine cost, and I can justify it in that matter, but I could never justify that to sell the grapes. I'm not sure if I really answered your question. So I sort of? Okay. Yes? I've got a few questions for you. It was an absolutely incredible talk. Uh, thank you for coming and visiting here. Um, I guess the first question is, you know, a lot of winemakers say the procedure is, I've heard them say the procedure is very similar uh, from vintage to vintage. How much, you know, sort of fruit tasting and analysis do you do before you really make your final decisions about how, how you're going to change one vintage to the next? And Wait, let me, do, let me do one question at a time. Yeah. Or I'll forget what you've asked. <laughs> so, the way that I approach it, and I'm a lot of it depends upon, for instance, how long have I worked with this vineyard? Mm -hmm. Okay, is this a vineyard I've worked with like all that money? I've worked with it since mm -hmm. the late 80s. Yep. So I've been through a lot of vintages. 
I know the variability. I've done a lot of experimenting over the years with different winemaking procedures to bring out the best of that. You know? Yeah. Or is it a new vineyard that I'm trying to figure out what this vineyard needs, like when George Ann was young? You know, what, what do we need to do here? So there's there's that. And then during the growing season, you can see what's happening. You know, it's not like it's just harvest and you didn't see if, if you were out there. So for instance, in 2010, we had a very cool spring, a cool season. And so people said, well, we're not gonna do much shoot thinning or thinning because we think there's gonna be, you know, loss of clusters or um, uh, necrosis of the, of the stems. So we're gonna leave all this fruit on there, all these extra shoots. I'm like, they're crazy, that's backwards. If it's cold, we need to make sure there's air circulation. So I said, no, we're gonna do our regular thinning and keep it like that. So people then have all this growth out there, this in Sonoma County, then when they saw it was things were starting to rot, then they ran out and did way too much leaf pulling. Like we did, we didn't understand about leaf pulling, which they just like stripped the fruit zone. So now there's no protection. I'm like, what are they doing? They're losing their heads. You gotta keep your head. You gotta, you know, not make rash judgments because you can't glue those leaves back on. Then we go from one day where it's 70 degrees the next day it's 110, 112. So guess what happened? So guess what happened? All that fruit turned black. And especially in the older vineyards that were nice, clean rolled between the rows. And you know, they're not real, you know, eight feet apart, no, 12 feet apart, 12 foot rows. And that dirt is nice and clean and the sun just puts that on. The only place we got burned was on the end rows where we have bird netting. You know, there were some grapes there that we had to take off. So the point is, it's not like you don't see what's coming. In 12 and in 13, there was a scary amount of food out there. You know, it reminded me of 05 and 06 when we had big berries. And then all you're thinking about is, okay, what am I going to do? You, you thin it as much as you can, because we're in control, at least we're doing that part. But still, even when you thin, there's a lot of fruit there. The berries are really big. Extraction is difficult. So you kind of have to change your game plan. You know, when we saw the 13 harvest coming, I went, oh my god, it looks like a repeat, almost, of 12. And so we came up with some different techniques to try. Um, in the winery. Some of it was in concert with talking to Dr. Adams, you know, facing the spinach, what are we going to do? And uh, so we came up with a new game plan, changed some things up, which happened to work. Yay. <laughs> but, you know, it's not like you're passive. If you want to just use a recipe, you have to make sure, and, and the nice thing is, too, if your grapes are spread out like ours, so we have Pinot Noir coming in from all over Russian River, starting the third week of August into late September. So we get in some grapes, and we're doing our phenolic work, so we know what we're dealing with. We're not without information. See, this is the thing. I like to have all that information so I know what I'm facing. And then we can try things on that those first grapes that come in and figure out what's going to work for the vintage. And generally, when you kind of get a pattern going to what's working for that vintage, you can carry it through with the same variety. So, did I answer that first part? Absolutely, thank okay. you, thank you so much. That was great. Um, I, and I've always been a huge fan, uh, the, the little bit that I've, that I've tried here, so I'm blog. And it's just so much richer and almost more of an after dinner sort of, or, or even, even call it more of a, almost more of a red, red and white wine with just so much flavor and so much body. Do you do a lot of that by living it on the leaves? No, I, I love what you said because um, it's funny how 
people who don't like Sauvignon Blanc or sometimes don't even like yeah. white wine yeah. like cars because it actually has body, which is what people like. They like wines to have body. And I think frankly, a wine like that should be drank after the reds. Well, it could be. I mean, we drink our Chardonnay sometimes after the reds. But, you know, we do, um, thinking back to when I first made Sauvignon Blanc, I made Sauvignon Blanc because I came from Mount Eden, where I only made, uh, well, I bought in the old Zinfandel, but I made Chardonnay from the Hill, Cabernet, and Pinot Noir. When I left the Hill, I'm like, okay, I'm going to make some other stuff, you know? I want to make some semi on I want to make some Sauvignon Blanc, I want to make Gewürztraminer, I want to make whatever, it's different. But I thought, hmm, I don't like Sauvignon Blanc. What am I going to do? You know, how am I going to make it so that I like it? Because again, going back to, I have to make what I like. How can I sell if I don't like it? Right? So, and remember, back in those days, Sauvignon Blanc was a mess in the vineyard because there was no nice bird control system where there was light. There was all this, they call it the, uh, I forget, the collapse vineyard uh, trouble system where you just have leaves everywhere and the fruit's all rotting and nothing gives any light. Full of parazines, you know, that green pepper. But I heard, first of all, that if you barrel ferment, a Sauvignon Blanc or any kind of wine that comes from a, an underripe region or whatever, that it would help get rid of some of that grassiness. So that's the first thing I did. I never knew about stirring leaves. So when I went to France in 1977 and I'm watching this, so I was like an undercover agent in France because <laughs> they thought I was a salesperson. Even though I would keep telling them I was a winemaker from America, they're like, oh, she's a salesperson, she's a woman. And of course not. Her French is just fast. So, <laughs> I would go on all these tours and stuff, and I, I, I asked them, well, can you stir the leaves in your barrel? And they go, no, 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 we don't stir the leaves. And I'd see these rolling barrels across the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so I came back and started experimenting with, you know, leaf stirring, to your point. Because, yes, it does make the wine richer, and we actually stir the Sauvignon Blanc twice a week. All of its barrel fermented very little new oak, only 18%, but it's the least stirring. Yeah. And then it's the old vine fruit that I use because when I started making Sauvignon Blanc in 2001 at Russian River, believe it or not, everyone was ripping out these old vineyards. So the Schoen Farm Junior College block that's like almost 40 years old now, I say for being ripped out because they're like, well, nobody wants to buy this. I said, I don't buy it. I'll pay market price. Well, it wasn't it wasn't raised uh, organically or biodynamically. I go, I don't care. I'll adopt this block. So that old vine character, then we put compost on it, it went nuts. Yeah. Now it's, I don't know if they're going to stop producing. But so again, that's another secret weapon I have is old vine fruit that yes. gives that richness. Yes. And then I also retaining a tiny bit of residual, natural residual sugar, which is not the same as adding concentrate. Try stopping Sauvignon Blanc when it's fermented to get about four tenths. It's not easy. We spend a lot of energy on that, as you can ask my staff about that. But that little tiny bit that's below the perceivable level of sweetness just adds this luscious character to the wine. So that's all my secrets now. Go ahead and make yourself Thank you very much. Maybe one more question, because uh, we have a reception. I'm sure Mary would entertain questions during that time period. Don't be shy. There you go. There's a lot of decision making that goes into the winemaking process. Um, can you maybe speak a little bit about particular aspects that you may have uh, doubted your process? Well, I'm a pretty confident person, so <laughs> I'm not exactly sure about that. I think about, but winemaking is full of so many decisions that if you doubted yourself, you would never get through it. This is what's happened to some people I've seen have breakdowns, mental yeah. breakdowns during harvest. You know, you have to, I always say, make a plan, change a plan. You, know, you have to be very flexible in this business, being a winemaker. You're making decisions on the fly. You're going out with a vineyard and saying, well, we're going to pick that tomorrow or this tomorrow or whatever. And 
the most difficult decision I make every year is my first picking day. I start nesting around the morning. They <laughs> I'm in the kitchen, like cleaning out cupboards. And, you know, when I'm out the vineyard, because I'm very nervous, because it's like that first decision. You know, am I going to make the right choice? Am I going to? Because our first vineyard is one of our best vineyards. It's George Ann. If I screw it up, it's I can't retrieve that right. That first decision. But at some point, somebody has to be responsible. Right? It has to be me, at least right now. And so you make the decision and then you go with it. If you make a mistake, you go, okay, I picked a little bit too early. I gotta really, you know, watch what I'm doing, do more sampling in the next video, whatever. But you have to just accept yourself. You have to accept that you're gonna make and we're all human. We don't have a machine doing this, you know. And no machine could do it to decide when the flavor's perfect and the numbers are perfect and you know the seeds are the right ripeness and everything, you know, the phenolics are good and all that stuff. So you just have to, you know, fortunately I'm at the point now where I have a lot of experience, and so I use all that experience. And it's just it's just in me now, it's part of what I do. But starting off, it's always very scary. Because every decision you make is like a part of this little tree that gets really complicated because, you know, I mean, every decision, there's, there's multiple decisions of, of what you can choose. It's just mind-boggling. The littlest decisions are just, uh, a few years ago, um, one of my favorite uh, yeast nutrients went off the market for a year. I flipped out because this is my favorite yeast nutrient. And so I had to try some of these other things, and it was like, how can this make such a huge difference? It was just mind-boggling and scary. Fortunately, the producer was back in production. But uh, it's sometimes interesting how you try these little things. I always say an experiment is a five-ton tank, okay? Five tons of fruit. That's a lot of money. All that money, that's not just you know, over $30,000 for the grapes. The potential wine, that's $62 a bottle. You know, we're talking, this is like big money decisions. So it's like, well, I'm just gonna, you know, do this or do that or throw in a different yeast or I'm gonna not use yeast or I'm gonna use this different nutrient or whatever I'm gonna do. That can mean that tank is out of the program. That's that's what I'm more concerned about, that, that young people don't get so enamored with their need to make decisions that they don't carefully think through the financial consequences for the winery that they own or they're working for because those things can be devastating that little trial i did those three tanks i didn't have any choice i had to figure out something new to use but they all went into a regional one fortunately i have enough why I make? We just need to use have a few tanks. Like my first job there with my few tanks. You just threw something up. There's no going back. But you still have to make the decisions and go forward and forgive yourself. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this next time. You know, I'm gonna double up the amount of uh, of you know testing that I do or whatever it is you're gonna do. Or I'm gonna be I'm gonna think through my trials. It was interesting, I used to teach sometimes that extension class on the weekends, the home winemaker one. And what really scared me there was how people just wanted to glom on to something, some technique they heard about, and apply it to something they were doing without really thinking through all of the consequences. You know, do they have the right equipment, do they have the right grapes, do they have the right, you know. And it, that's scary to me. You've got to think through all this stuff, you know. Every harvest, I make a plan. Make a plan, change a plan. I, may, I look at every vineyard, all the tanks I'm going to put the wine in, what trials I want to do that year. It's all in a big spreadsheet in my computer. And those things change, but at least I have a roadmap of where I'm going and the things I want to try. Sometimes I can't try any of them. I have to throw it all out, you know. Like if I said, if I see something's working during the harvest, yeah, but I'm not going to do that trial this year because this is what I know is working. But you do need a roadmap, at least I feel like. But the other thing too that she doesn't tell you is that 
the fidgeting starts about the 15th of August, <laughs> just before harvest, and she comes to bed at night, and she fidgets all night long. <laughs> toss and turn and toss and turn all night long. I know, I know about the fidgeting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, please let's give Mary a tremendous Ask Mary more questions.